John, you may want to leave me a little louder than normal because I'm not going to talk very loud today. And perhaps you have already noticed that whenever Corey is in charge, something always goes wrong. This morning, I can't even get the people going the right direction on the offering. Martha, I don't think you've ever been that far way over there before. Uh, uh, it reminds me of a Sunday when I was at a church. And another church sent a committee to look at me to possibly hire me for their church. And of course, those are the Sundays you want to be just right. You know what I mean? Just perfect. So we practiced extra hard that Wednesday. Of course, the choir didn't know why they practiced that hard. And that Sunday morning, I made sure that my, my most certain person led the choir in. And they did. They led them right in, the wrong row, marched all the way across the row, got to the other end, came back, marched all the way back down the other row, and got over here and looked at me like, now where do we go? <laughs> so uh, the question this morning, can you recall? Yeah, I recall. I recall a lot of stupid things I've done in my life. And it's a miracle that God still wants me to serve him. Uh, you know I always look for the craziest places to find sermon <laughs> topics, right? And you always wonder about them. I just want to reassure you that after today, you'll, you'll always be able to say, Corey will never find one crazier than this one. So today is the top. But wait. samples here. Folks, I don't mind telling you I made a bundle pushing used cars. And starting this weekend, I'm passing my profits on to you. Come on down to the lot and ask one of our salesmen out of on parole to work out some terms for you. That's BR549. And hold down the collect calls. I'm no Rockefeller, you know. I can't tell you how many times someone has asked me for my number and I said, let's well, be BR549. And they either laugh like you do or they look at me like I'm an idiot because they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> this week's sermon came to me six or eight weeks ago, listening to the radio, driving down the road. And the commercial, I have no idea what it was talking about, but the lead line to the commercial was, hey, do you remember your phone number growing up? And of course, I immediately thought of my phone number, 502-233-4401. Then I thought, that wasn't my phone number growing up. That was my grandparents' phone number growing up. And, and that's the number that went straight to my head. And then I got to thinking, why did I remember some number other than my own? Well, that was the number I called the most. When I wanted something, to call my grandparents. When I needed something, I called my grandparents. When I, for the summer, needed a place to work, I went and lived on my grandparents' farm and worked there. So really, that was my phone number growing up. I drove on down the road. I didn't hear the next four or five minutes on the radio. I have no idea what was said. I just kept thinking, 233-4401. I wonder who's got that phone number now. So you know me, shy me. I thought, well, I'll just call them. And talk to them. <laughs> and see, after 24 years since my grandmother's passed, I'll just see who's got that number and tell them what a, what a blessed number they've got. So I, of course, Western Kentucky's no longer 502, right? They're now 270. So I was already in trouble because I was dialing a foreign number. <laughs> so I dialed 270-233-4401. By the way, when I was a kid, remember we didn't use all the numbers? When I was a kid, it was just 24401. It became 233 sometime in the 70s. Before that, you just dialed 24401 and you got them. Or you could just pick up the phone and maybe the other person on the other, other line that was sharing a line with you would be the person you're looking for anyway. So that happened. But anyway, I dialed 270-233-4401. And the strangest thing happened. It rang about four times. And then this message came on. The number you have reached is no longer in service. I really wasn't prepared for that. 
I thought after 24 years, that number would have been put back in service. I thought somebody else's kids and grandkids had fallen in love with calling their family there. Then I got to thinking, has she really been gone that long? Has he really been gone even longer? I, I don't remember anything else driving home that day. I just remember thinking, that phone number may not be in service, but my mommery and pappy are still in service with me. Amen. So this morning I want to tell you how, specifically, my grandmother, because that's who I think of when I think of a family member that loved me. I think of my grandmother. I want to tell you how she is still in service in my life. And I want to show you a little about her and who she was. And uh, I never met that lady. I met someone that looks like she might have been her mother or maybe her grandmother. But I think that's the week she got married. And if you look right over here, look at her left arm. You see a tan line? She was a farm girl. She knew how to work. She never forgot how to work and she never missed an opportunity to teach me and all of her other 10 grandchildren how to work. She was also a saint. How do I know she was a saint? The day after she married my grandfather, her mother-in-law moved in with her <laughs> for 36 years. Now, excuse me, St. Mary, right? My grandmother never said a curse word in her life. At a funeral once, I said to her, what was it like having your mother-in-law live with you for 36 years? With no pause, she mentioned a place none of us want to go. Okay? You all know how much I love Pookie, right? You know how much we enjoy having Pookie with us and training her. And Lola, you know over the years, you've, you've been with us all of Lola's life. How we've enjoyed being a part of Lola's life. I learned to take that role on by my grandparents, specifically my grandmother. Not only did her mother-in-law live with her for 36 years, but at one time she counted more than 25 people who had one time or another lived in hers and her husband's house. Think about that. Over, over 50 years, more than half, excuse me, 60 years, because I watched them celebrate their 60th anniversary. Over 60 years, more than half of that time, they had someone that was not their children living with them. Take, not taking care of mommy and pappy, my mommy and pappy taking care of them. My grandmother found a lot of ways to be of service. It started with being a good mom. I'll just give you an example, then you can imagine the type of mom she was. My mother and my uncle Tom, two years apart, they liked to squabble with each other. And my grandmother would take it as long as she could, and then she'd say, we're done, go. Now, when she said go, what that meant was, you have done too much, you are in trouble, you know what your punishment is. Can anyone guess what their punishment was? Their punishment was to wash the windows of the house. <laughs> one on the inside and one on the outside. And they had to look at each other while cleaning the window, and they couldn't move to the next window until that one was clean on both sides. So she physically barriered them away from each other while making them learn to cooperate. She applied that logic to all parts of her life. It wasn't enough that she raised some 25 people. It wasn't enough that her mother-in-law lived with her, that, that I lived with her several years, myself, growing up. She decided she had to reach more people, so she was also a school teacher for 50 years. She was also a pastor's wife in a small church, not unlike this one, just slightly smaller. One that had many needs and few people to meet those needs. So here are some of the roles she took on. WMU, Methodist Women, her version, president, pianist for the worship, Sunday school teacher. Remember, all these happening at the same time. 
mimeograph operator. She made the bulletins. Okay. Vacation Bible school director. Now this was back in the day when they didn't have all the goodies that came with it. Anything you wanted to use for vacation, vacation Bible school, you made yourself. She had this big flip chart. About four feet tall, about four feet wide, that each page was second grade school teacher writing, you know how clean that is, written out every song you were going to sing and every, every pledge you were going to make and every scripture for every day. She did all that while running a 1,200 acre farm. This is a woman that knew how to serve. And I can't tell you how often when I want to do something and my spirit takes over and I think, I'm going to do it my way. Her gentle reminder says, Corey, just do what's right. And it pulls me back where I need to be. So I want to challenge what that voice on the phone said to me. What that voice said is this number is no longer in service. I believe the scripture teaches us that we stay in service for good or bad. For generations. As a matter of fact, Exodus 20 verse 5 says this, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the sins of the Father on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who despise me, but showing loving kindness to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I mean, do the math. If you're a bad person, you might affect two, maybe three generations. If you're a good, God-loving person, you might affect a thousand generations. I had an opportunity to write an article about uh, someone for a, a contest in the state of Kentucky years ago. And I chose to write about my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Leonard Page. Leonard Page came over from England, settled in Goochland County, Virginia, and then in 1762, he and a bunch of other Baptists moved together during what, what became known as the great Russellville Revival. Revival. They moved together to Russellville, Kentucky. And my seven times great-grandfather ended up sponsor, or starting and pastoring seven different churches over the next five decades of his life. Most of those churches are still in existence. One of those churches was First Baptist Russellville. What is special about First Baptist Russellville? It was the church that Southern Baptist, remember Southern Baptist, meant before, before the Civil War. What did it mean? It means you were a Baptist but believed in slavery. Where Southern Baptist and Northern Baptist came together in 1866 for the first time ever, right after the Civil War, to say, we're going to choose to believe together. So a church that my seven-time great-grandfather started was the church where healing began to bring churches back together after the Civil War. You know, it was five generations later that this girl married my granddad, also a preacher. And now, two generations later... Look who's preaching. But much more important than that. In spite of all the mistakes I've made, look who God is still using. Because you know what's happening at this very moment? My son Daniel is picking up, right now, he's picking up his guitars and all of his wires and everything, headed home after having played for two worship services in Lorton, Virginia. And you know what else is happening right now? My son Stephen is playing drums at a Lutheran church in Nashville, Tennessee. Right now. You think my grandmother's still in service? You think my seven time great grandfather is still in service? It's what the Bible says. I'm going to let my grandmother, in her own words, and then I'll stop talking about her, let my grandmother, in her own words, tell you how she sees life. Remember, she was a teacher. <clears throat> Though I have reached rank two on the teacher's pay scale and have 15 hours towards the next level, but do not love children, 
I'm become as a noisy gong or a clanging bell. Though I be able to talk over their heads until they think, I think they are looking up to me and wondering at my brilliance. But do not leave them to hunger for knowledge and to love living. I have wasted their time and mine. I may give my time to work out a new curriculum and even learn ways to teach Johnny how to read. But if I let Johnny go on to the next teacher without the, without the ability to read his social studies, I have done him no good. Do I speak the language of new math and can change base 2 to base 8, but fail to help Sarah reach first base in her struggle to be somebody? I have failed. Though I know the list of basic foods and can count calories, but fail to give Richard a hunger for knowledge and a thirst for learning, my menu planning will leave him with a nausea for school. Though I know our state of Kentucky from Tug Fork to the great Mississippi and can boast that I have visited every park, both state and national, and have let children go through classes and grow up to burn our flag or speak with less than pride of our country, I am but a traitor and worker of evil. Teaching is patience and kindness. Teaching is not bluster and boasting or even just a job. A teacher is not happy with failure, but happy when she has lit a spark in the eyes of a child. A teacher never gives up, but faith, hope, and patience are kept alive and working. Teaching is a calling. Inspiration must not, must not fail. Teaching is a gift, but the more we share that gift, the fuller becomes the meal barrel of gifts. Our time with each other is so short but when the patchwork of our combined efforts have been fastened together, then our parts shall have been melted into one, and the parts shall disappear. When he's a child, he will speak as a child. His feeling and thinking are like a child. But when he becomes a man, he will put away childish things. For now, he sees through untrained eyes and the ignorance of the future. But when he comes face to face with the reality of living with others and of fighting for his place in the sun, he will either love life and make a contribution to society, or he will pass his days supported by welfare and hating the establishment. And now abide three things, knowledge, ability, and love of children. But the greatest of these is love. I think what I need to ask you today is where do you stand? Are you still in service? Do your children and grandchildren know your number by heart? Do they look to you for wisdom, guidance? Why are you still here? The Bible speaks to this in several places. James chapter 5. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Matthew 5 says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 1 Peter says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he comes back. Romans chapter 15 says it this way. We who are strong ought not to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. I know as we get older, we start doing fewer and fewer of the things we used to be able to do. We start thinking, do I really matter anymore? Am I really making a difference? This slide challenges that thought. Because it tells us we can make a difference. But my favorite part is the bottom. We can't make a difference without taking the first step. 
Have you ever seen these ads like this where, hey, if you want to buy something, call this number, and then across the bottom, the number is there? You just rip it off and take it home and call that number and find out more. Well, I think the answer is for us. If we want to still matter, we still want to make a difference, we have to take the first step, and that is to say, I will. I will. So how do we make a difference? I've decided to try to make a difference by teaching my children. Making them hear all my sermons. Now my sermons are usually about 30 seconds long and they usually happen in a car on the way to somewhere. Ask any of my kids. Ask Lola, she will tell you. Ask Lola's friends who ride with us. They can quote most of my many sermons. I only do it every single time. Hey, if I don't do it, who's going to? Lola doesn't have another male role model in her life. It's me or nobody. Pookie is slightly more fortunate. She's got me and she's got her uncle Garrick. She is at Garrick and Lindsay's house right now, learning, learning that there's another couple that loves her. And, and having another man hold her and tell her how important she is and how much she's loved. Yeah. Who are you telling that to? Who are you reminding? Your mama and granddad love you. We're proud of you. Barb's back there no nodding. She knows. How many kids are you raising? How many people have been through your home, even while your mother was there? And still, when you say the words, I'm proud of you, the toughest kid just lights up. Because they need to hear that. I believe in you. I don't have all the answers. I just know to try to make a difference every day. Let me quote what some other people have said about it, because maybe some of them can speak to you. Elaine Dalton said... If you desire to make a difference in the world, you must first be different from the world. I can assure you I'm about as different as they come. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Don't let other people define who you are. Be who you think, who you know in your heart God intended you to be. You do that. And a thousand generations from now, someone will be talking about somebody they don't even know the name, but somebody in their family changed their family for the good. And now their children are the preachers. Their children are the missionaries. Their great-grandchildren are the doctors and nurses and teachers of the world. To make a difference in someone's life, you don't have to be brilliant or rich or beautiful or perfect. You just have to care enough to be there. How many times have you been to a child or a grandchild's ball game or math competition or whatever and looked around the room and there's 40 kids and maybe 15 parents? When Anelle and I got married, I chose to take a job in sales for a very specific reason. I had no clock to push. If I made money or didn't was up to me, but I was going to have enough time to go to every practice, every performance, every event our five children were in. I can remember going to a soccer game in southeastern Missouri. And our daughter, Anel's daughter, my stepdaughter, was playing soccer. And she went into the, sta into the stadium and looked around. The place was practically empty. And over there on one side, there I sat. She came running over to me, hugged me, and said, why are you here? I said, because I'm your father. Amen. To make a difference, you've got to be there. Mother Teresa, in this life, we cannot always do great things. But we can't always do small things with great love. John Gordon, don't chase success. 
decide to make a difference, and success will find you. What you do makes a difference. Some of you say, my life is too difficult to have time to help others. You know what? There are people who would love to have your bad days. Ann Landers. Ann Landers said, it is not what you do for your children, but what you have taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. Washing the windows, both sides. Getting in step with the other people you have to deal with in life. I don't know who said this, but I like it. You can tell who the strong people are. They're the ones building up each other instead of tearing each other down. I don't know who Jay Danzi is, but Jay said, your smile is your logo. I have to stop here. My mother-in-law, I didn't meet her until she was already in her 70s. I didn't really become a part of her life until she was already in her 80s. And she looked like the rest of us at that age. Weathered, worn, tired. But when she smiled, the entire room lit up. Not unlike how I feel when Pookie smiles at me. But my dear sweet mother-in-law could light up an entire room and melt anyone's heart just with her smile. Let's go back to these words. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. How you leave others feeling after having an experience with you is your trademark. I'm going to admit that I don't always leave the most positive impression on other people. Because one of the gifts God has given me is the ability to get something done. And I have to remember to temper that ability to get something done with and avoid stepping on toes while you do it. Because I can tell you that my skill set for getting things done is stronger, unfortunately, than my desire to not step on toes. Thank you for not saying amen. I, I, <laughs> I, I paused. I paused. I gave you the chance. You were kind. Then I looked down and Jane was squeezing your hand. So. I know, I know. <laughs> Folks, that last thing is so true. How you leave others feeling after having an experience with you becomes your trademark. That's why I love my momery so much. Because I felt important when I was around her. There are, she's been gone 25 years, okay? There are nights when I'm trying to say my prayers. When I can't get to my prayers... Because I'm so busy thanking God for my momery. How would you like to feel like that? More importantly, how would you like for your children and grandchildren to feel about you like that? Maybe you need to learn how to balance your ability to make people do things with your ability to make people feel loved. If you didn't hear anything else today, maybe that's what you needed to hear. I just want to reassure you, there is a reason you are still here. Can you imagine how less last Sunday's event would have been had Jarman had his accident a week earlier and couldn't have been here to be part of it? Right? Folks, you're still here for a reason, every one of you. And your reason is not to tell me that you now have 114 great-grandchildren. <laughs> the reason is for those 114 to feel loved by you. That's the reason. Right. Why are you still here? It's to make a difference. 
And don't think there's ever going to come a time in your life when you no longer make a difference. And don't think that just because you failed in some of your past times, or even a lot of your past times, that God can't change that, because He can. And if, we are, if you are a young parent today, and my guess is most people can guess who I'm speaking to right at this moment, <laughs> know this. God will be there for you every single moment. He will forgive and help you through the mistakes you're bound to make. And he's going to always be encouraging you and you and you and you and you to try to get things right for those people are looking at you, depend on you to know who God is. You're the only Jesus that little boy will ever see. Or that little girl at the door begging to come in. Folks, you can make a difference. You're left here for a reason. Plug in. Maybe you need to memorize a grandchild's phone number and start calling and checking on them. Don't wait for them to call you. Teach them to call you by calling them. I love that old phone, that old black phone. My grandparents were as tight as tight can be. Where do you think I learned it? With one possible exception. Did you know that they rented that phone for $2 a month for at least 42 years? I, right? Remember the old black phone? Did you look at your phone bill? You paid $2 a month to rent it. You didn't own it. I still remember the 80s. When we finally convinced my grandfather to get a different phone, I thought it was going to kill him. Because that's always been the phone he had. But I can't look at that without thinking 233-4401. Whatever else is wrong in this world, I could call my grandparents. Because they love me. They believe in me. This week we get to do something for one of our children. They're buying a new house. And there's a gap between when they're closing on their house and when they're buying the new house. The new house is first. And God has blessed me to be able to cover that gap. I'll buy the house. They can pay me back when the time comes. Where'd I learn that? Right behind that phone in my grandparents' house was a little two-drawer file cabinet. The bottom file drawer cabinet has an, one envelope in it, and it says, school help. And in that, in that manila envelope was a bunch of envelopes that where like you get a letter, there's an envelope, and you, you read the letter, you throw the envelope away. No, my granddad kept all those envelopes when he cut them open. And then on the envelope it would say, January 2, 1963, Corey, $6,000. And we'd stick it, in the, stick it in the file. And if at any given time you were to look at that file, there would be hundreds of thousands of dollars that he had loaned out. And at some point, my grandmother said, I'm tired of looking at that file. Let's make those gifts. And my $6,000 went away. And so did everybody else's. Wow. Wow. To be able to make a difference. Financial is one of the ways we, get, we gauge making a difference. But the real difference had already happened. They had already loved me. They already taught me to be a responsible adult. That's just a, one step that they're showing the world. Hey, we may be old, but we can still make a difference. What about you? <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm not too good at being in charge. We're going to sing another of my grandmother's favorite songs. Which gives me a chance to remember how much she taught me and what a difference she made in my life. And as we sing it, I want you to think about not only the people who have made a difference in your life, but also who God has left you here to be responsible to make a difference in their life. Because that's really what this sermon was about.